I am a retired Army Special Forces operator who has 20 years of experience under my belt. Ten of those years were spent with the Scout Rangers conducting jungle reconnaissance, covert operations, raids, hostage rescue, and all the other special operation tasks that you would expect from elite military formations like SR. Meanwhile, the other 10 years was dedicated to hunting down mythical and paranormal creatures and employing said creatures against internal and external threats to the nation. Now I can bore you with stories of my first 10 years in the Rangers, but I doubt that that would be anything new from these stories that you've already heard special forces operators do. Go behind enemy lines, stay undercover for weeks on end, Raid enemy camps. Those are all the usual stories that have been told by others before me. So instead of telling my experiences there, I'll instead go straight to the one that I'm sure has piqued your interest. My tenure is working with mythical and paranormal creatures. The idea of using mythical and paranormal creatures may seem strange at first. However, it has been a practice that has been an armed forces doctrine for nearly seven decades now, and I doubt that they have plans of removing it anytime soon. It is an effective method of clearing an area of enemies, and although mistakes can result in catastrophic problems, such occurrences are few. Now, I'm not saying that mistakes rarely happen, because a good number of them happened in the past. However, their numbers are small enough that not many people take note of them. Besides, since operations often happen in isolated areas and hostile insurgent territory, any unexpected casualties from nearby innocent civilians can easily be blamed on the local insurgency. Now, I can go into more detail about the cover-up campaigns and the screening operations made by the government to hide their use of mythical and paranormal creatures. But that task is assigned to another special operation group of the armed forces. I'm not exactly sure of what their operations are, or how their operations group is run, but I do know that they are effective in their job. Anyways, getting back on track. My special operations group is known as the Mythical and Paranormal Warfare Operations Group, the MPWOG. Although we just refer to it as the MPOG, since it's less of a mouthful. You're probably thinking that I'm crazy right now for saying this and I can't blame you. If I heard of such a thing all those years ago, I would have laughed too if I had heard of such a group. It sounds outrageous and silly. I mean true, the armed forces use psychological warfare to trick insurgents that creatures like asswings were out to get them. But those were nothing more than just props and sounds, not actual mythical creatures. However, if it weren't for the fact that I encountered MPOG during one of those few accidents that I was talking about, then I would have never thought that the government really used creatures of pure evil to fight its enemies. It happened sometime around 1988. Back then, my scout ranger company was deployed at Southern Luzon to assist Regional Unified Command foreign operations against the communist insurgents in the area. Patrolling the various jungle covered mountains in the region, we would spend weeks out in the field, trying to locate any trails that led to the insurgent camps. Because of the dense jungle in the area, it wasn't too hard for the enemy to conceal their camps from aerial observation. Unable to locate insurgent bases from the air, it was up to us rangers to hunt them down. However, on one of our nightly hunts, we had encountered something that would change the rest of my career. Trekking through the mountainous jungle, trying to keep as silent as possible, my squad went through an unmarked path, hoping to find any evidence of insurgent activity. The plan was to find as many tracks as possible until they led us to the main camp. This was easier said than done but we like to pride ourselves at being good at these kinds of jobs. All around us were a dense concentration of trees and slippery, muddy ground, while just a few meters away, on both of our flanks, were various mountain caves that ominously stared at us. 
from my position near the head of our column. I did my best to constantly glance towards the caves, being mindful to note any sign of movement. In such places were perfect hiding spots and there was no way of telling if an insurgent was hiding inside, ready to come out and fire a long burst of automatic rifle fire. And despite being special forces, night vision goggles were pretty rare back then, especially for us field units. And because of this, we had to rely on our eyes, the moonlight, and our refined instincts in order to feel what was in our surroundings. A few hours into our patrol, my point man, APFC Gomez, reported seeing smoke a few meters ahead of us, immediately ordering a halt. I told my squad to take a defensive position and keep their eyes open for a potential ambush. After that, I quietly made my way forward until I had reached Gomez, who was crouching down by some underbrush. What's up ahead? I asked in a whisper as I crouched down next to him. He pointed towards a tree up ahead of us. You see that big tree over there? Well, when the wind blew and it caused the leaves of the trees ahead of us to begin to sway, I managed to get a quick and clear view of its top, and I noticed there was smoke coming from it. From on top of the tree, I asked, squinting my eyes to stare at where he was pointing at. Are you sure? I'm sure, just wait for the wind. And so I did. Soon enough, a strong breeze came along, making the many branches of the trees around us sway, opening up the curtain of leaves that had earlier blocked my line of sight. Through that small opening, I had just managed to see the top of the big tree that Gomez was pointing at, and right on top of it was a trail of smoke. Reflecting from the moonlight, a trail of thin white smoke emitted from inside a wall of large leaves atop the tree, as it were a chimney. I found this odd, and I remember thinking how strange it was for someone to make camp on top of a tree. But I quickly shrugged off my doubts, as I realized that it could be an insurgent lookout who was using the tree as a safe outpost to guard the perimeter. I had never encountered such a situation before, but it made sense to me at the time. A large tree provided a safe, concealed place from where a sentry could stay for the night and observe the ground below him. With that in mind, I convinced myself that it was indeed probably an insurgent there who had stupidly lit a fire on top of his tree or had carelessly decided to smoke a cigarette. Whichever of the two, it gave away his position. The presence of an outpost like that could have been a sign that we were close to the camp. Emboldened by this, I decided to push my squad forward to further investigate the area and gather more intelligence. Following behind Gomez, I kept my eyes on the tree, looking for any sign of movement. The rest of the squad followed behind us, all alert and ready to engage in case something bad happened. And then all of a sudden, I heard the sound of rustling leaves and bending branches. Quickly reacting to this, I aimed my rifle forward and pointed it towards the big tree ahead of us. By then, we were only 10 meters away from the tree, and I was afraid that the insurgent noticed our approach and hurriedly got down to make an escape. However, when I scanned the area near the tree, I saw no person nearby. Thinking that he had managed to escape and run for home, I let out a curse of frustration. In my mind, I assumed that he would soon be informing his superior of our presence, and we would then have a patrol sent against us. Not wanting to risk any action with such a small forest, I began planning our escape. However, before I could give out any orders, a deep and old voice spoke loudly from our right. You are not supposed to be here, it said firmly, making me almost jump from my position. Out of instinct, I immediately pointed my weapon at the source of the sound, and the rest of my squad did the same. At first, I couldn't actually see the source of the voice. However, as I searched the shadows, my eyes soon fell on something that made my spine shiver in fear. Through the dim light of the moon, I managed to see a bulky and naked man, 
with his skin so dark that he almost seemed like a shadow. Scanning his body, I couldn't help but notice how large and grotesque his arms and legs and torso were. The muscles on them were large and seemingly deformed, and giving him a shape that seemed odd and unsettling. Soon, fixing my gaze upon his face, I then saw two wide white eyes staring back at me with an unnatural aura that made my heart nearly stop in fright. I don't scare easily, so I was surprised at how scared I was feeling during that moment. Studying the person before me, I was unsure why he looked so strange and so frightening. I felt uneasy just to stand before him, and I had to fight the urge to step back and bolt away from him. I was confused by this and didn't know why I was so scared. I'm trying my best to keep my composure, I tried to push away further thought of fear as I spoke up towards the person who had stumbled upon us. Who are you? I asked, keeping my sights trained on him, as I kept a stern grip on my weapon. What are you doing here? It responded to my question by laughing. In a very rough tone, it let out a deep laugh, as if it was mocking me for asking him such questions. Normally, I would have been angry at such a taunt, but instead I felt scared. Watching him carefully, I then saw his hand move to grab something, forcing me to act on my instincts. Don't move. Keep your hands on your sides. I shouted, but he simply ignored me. In my mind, I thought he was grabbing for a gun or worse, a grenade. Reacting as fast as I can, I quickly pressed the trigger of my rifle. However, to my surprise, I found myself unable to do so. Trying to will my finger to pull the trigger, I realized that I could not do it. The simple act, one that I have done countless times, could not be done. As if some kind of invisible force was preventing me, I found my finger frozen and stopped. And then I noticed that my squad was not reacting to the strange man's movements. I knew them each one of the rangers in my squad, and I knew that they too would have instantly pulled the triggers of the rifles and shot the man, yet not a single shot was fired. Finding my body frozen and my heart pumping fast in fear, I was surprised to find that I was still able to turn my head. Looking left and right, I saw each member of my squad as seemingly frozen, as if we were all stuck in a pose of pointing our guns at the man, but unable to do anything else but turn our heads. Studying the expressions of the rangers closest to me, I could see the fear plastered on their faces, the same fear that I knew was on mine. Trying to mask the fear with anger, I could hear a chorus of curses coming out of their mouths as they tried to comprehend what was happening. I too would have let out a curse, but the remaining calm part of my mind told me that it wouldn't have done anything to change the situation. So instead of shouting, I remained silent and returned my focus to the strange man. Checking what the man had grabbed, I was surprised and confused to see that he had picked up a thick lit cigarette, whose smoke and stench freely floated in the air. Placing the cigarette in his mouth, he then looked at each one of us and gave an unsettlingly large smile, which revealed teeth that were as white as his eyes. I'm not supposed to let anyone pass through this trail, it told us in its deep voice. Then it began to move closer towards us. None of you should be here. Still unable to move, we were left helpless. One of my rangers, a PFC Dominguez, found himself being approached directly by the strange man. Watching the man as he approached Dominguez, I could see him smile at the ranger and blow a thick cloud of smoke towards his face, making the ranger cough. After coughing out the smoke that he had hailed, Dominguez turned his head to give the man a long look before turning his head towards me. Sergeant, I think, he began, his voice shaky as both me and the strange man stared at him. I think he's a copre. A copre, a creature known to lurk in the jungles and mess around with those who travel through them. We had all heard the stories as kids, and as I stared at the man before us then, then I still found it hard to believe that the man before was a copre. 
that small part of my brain tried to rationalize what was actually happening. As I thought that cop rays were nothing but mythical creatures, they couldn't possibly exist. I fought the urge to believe what Dominguez had said and instead thought that what really was before us was an insurgent. Somehow this insurgent had administered some sort of airborne chemical agent that had paralyzed our bodies and prevented us from moving. That was what I tried to convince myself. I would have held on to that belief if it were not for the events that happened next. Staring sharply at Dominguez with his large eyes, I saw the man's expression change from amused to hurt, and then to angered. Feeling my blood chill, I felt my fear rise up as he moved his face closer towards Dominguez until his eyes were staring directly at him. Don't you ever dare call me a capre, its deep voice shouted, the noise seemingly echoing all around us. You will pay for what you said. And then he moved his head to stare at each one of us, scanning our faces and glancing at our eyes. You will all pay for being here tonight. None of you are supposed to be here. Trying to comprehend what he meant, I suddenly felt my thoughts interrupted when my hands suddenly began to move against my will. Unable to stop them, I let out a curse as I felt my hands loosen its grip on my rifle, before having one hand move towards the holster of my sidearm. My eyes went wide when I felt my hand grip my pistol and pull it out of the holster. Being willed by something else, my hands then switched off the safety of the pistol before raising the weapon up. Realizing what was happening, I tried my best to fight my own uncontrollable hand. Don't resist it, the copre said, his voice low and seemingly everywhere. Do it. Don't fight back. Let your desire end the pain. Using all the willpower that I had, I fought and fought trying to tell my own hand not to obey the copre's will. To my surprise, my efforts seemed to be doing something, as the smooth movement of my hand suddenly slowed as if encountering resistance. Feeling encouraged, I closed my eyes and tried to blot out the voice of the copre, but suddenly got knocked off my concentration when I heard three loud gunshots. My senses returned to my surroundings and my ears then caught three firm thuds around me, and I soon realized what it was. Corporal Villanueva, PFC Gomez, and PFC Ronaldo all carried sidearms. If they were being willed to do the same thing my own hands were trying to do to me, then it means that they had lost the fight. Unable to spare a second degree for them, I tried to return my focus to my own battle. However, I was once more distracted by the shouts and curses from the remaining members of my squad. PFC Dominguez, PFC Hernandez, and PFC Isidro did not have sidearms, but they did carry combat knives for covert operations. The horrible image of that filled my mind as I realized that this was a much worse fate compared to being taken out by your own sidearm against your will. Listening to their battle, I felt my heart drop as they cried out in anger and frustration. Letting out screams, they fought hard to save their lives, but it sounded like a losing battle. Join your friends, the copre said, his words ringing in my ears. It is time to rest now, so let it be and don't fight back. Death will be swift and peaceful. A succession of sharp stabs could then be heard, followed by gurgling sounds after each one. I knew where their knives went, and I felt heartbroken as each one of them fell to the ground, leaving me as the only one left in my squad. With my heart broken and my mind sufficiently distracted, my uncontrollable hand was able to gain some advantage, as it managed to move the barrel of my pistol closer to my temple. Emotionally drained by the loss of my rangers, a small part of me felt that I should give in and let this unknown force make my hand take me out. But I was a stubborn person and I kept fighting. I knew that it was losing the fight and that it was only a matter of time before the pistol got a good angle against me, but I would not just give in so easily. I wanted to fight until the last second, just like my rangers did. Trying my best to return my will to my hand, I concentrated as much as I could, 
trying to avoid any distraction. This, however, proved harder than expected, as the copre moved itself in front of me and stared. Chuckling deeply as it watched me, it stared right into my eyes. By doing this, I found it harder to fight my hand, as the copre gave some sort of invisible power to ensure that I would lose. Your friends are waiting for you, he said. What's the point of living without them? Join them, join them, join them. Cursing it over and over, I allowed my rage to give me strength to resist for just a bit longer, but each second brought the barrel of my pistol closer and closer to my temple. I was now losing the strength and sheer anger and force of will would not prevent my oncoming death. However, just before the barrel could move the last inch towards my temple, I suddenly felt the unseen control of my hand loosen and then disappear. Taken by surprise by this, I looked forward towards the copper to see him stare at something behind me before slowly backing away. As he retreated, I felt the wonderful sensation of being able to control my body once more, feeling suddenly weak as my will was returned. I almost collapsed onto the ground. However, I managed to maintain enough strength to keep myself up. As I watched the copre move backwards before turning around to make a sprint in what looked like in an attempt to escape. But before it could get away, it suddenly stopped, as if someone had blocked its path. Before I could find out what had stopped it, I suddenly heard the sound of footsteps behind me. Instinctively, I turned around and suddenly saw three figures approaching me. At first, I mistook the dark silhouettes approaching me as more capres. However, I soon realized that these figures were smaller. A careful study of them reassured me that they were not creatures of the unknown but instead fellow humans. But as I studied them, I couldn't help but wonder who they were. The three men had black battle dress uniforms and they made them easily blend with the night. Staring at them as they approached, I noticed all three of them had their weapons drawn and ready. However, I also noticed that each one of them had a hand raised. Focusing on their raised hands, I noticed that they were all holding a large bottle with a silver-colored material inside of it. For a moment, I wondered what was inside that bottle, before letting my thoughts drift and wonder who these men were. Inspecting the gear on them, I was impressed to see that they were fully kitted for combat and night operation, and aside from the fact that they lacked a helmet, they seemed to remind me of combat-ready American soldiers. With night vision goggles on their faces, ballistic vests protecting their torso, and a vest filled with rifle magazines and grenades, they looked nothing like the common field soldiers in the armed forces. Due to their luck, I initially mistook them as American Special Forces who somehow stumbled upon my predicament. However, a quick greeting and tag along quickly threw away my assumption, as I soon realized that these men were Filipino. Hey, are you alright? One of them asked as he approached me. Yeah, I managed to reply, my voice shaky. Lifting my hand, I saw that it was shaking also. The battle had taken its toll, both on my mind and body. Good, he told me, with a hint of relief in his voice. You're one lucky person, you know that. Moving closer to check on me, he soon pulled me aside so I could find a place to sit and rest. As he did this, I was able to look at the ground around me to see six bodies lying on the ground. I felt a pang in my heart as I saw them. My whole squad was dead now, and emotions swirled inside me at the thought of it. As I sat down and tried to reflect on what happened, I suddenly remembered the creature that caused all of this trouble and turned my attention towards the direction that I last saw him. Still standing in the same spot, I saw the copre remained unmoving in his position, as another group of black-cladded soldiers emerged from the darkness, weapons drawn and ready. Although I had a hard time seeing clearly in the night, I did note that this group also had raised hands and I knew that this meant that they too were carrying these same bottles filled with silver-colored material. As these men got closer to the copre, the creatures seemed to hiss in anger at each step they took. However, unlike his earlier arrogance and dominance, 
The Capri looked helpless against the new arrivals. Once more, my curiosity was ignited, as I wondered why these men were and what was so special about these bottles that these men carried. As I sat there and watched, I took in what I could and hoped that I would at least get some answer from them later on. After a while, most of the black-clad men formed a circle around the Capre, while one detached himself from the main group and walked towards me. As he got closer, he took a quick glance towards my fallen rangers before doing a sign of the cross. I'm sorry about your friends, he told me. I'll detail one of the squads to recover them once we secure our target. You mean the Capre? I inquired. Yeah, but that's not a Capre. Never mistake it as one. They hate it when you do that, he said, gesturing towards the terrible monster behind him. What that is, is Agta. Similar to a Capra, yes, but only native to the eastern VCIs. Unlike Capras, they're more hostile and can get very dangerous. But they're easy to control once you get Mercury near them. Is that what you were carrying in those bottles? I asked. Yeah, he said, before continuing his explanation. Mercury has this magical effect on them that weakens their power. And Agta can seduce you to do things you don't like. But if you have mercury on you, then it is unable to use its power or strength. Well, that's good to know, I said, making a note to always bring mercury with me in any future patrol. However, as he explained the creature to me, there was one thing that nagged my mind. Taking my chances, I decided to ask him in hopes of getting an answer. You said that Agtas were native to Eastern Visayas, right? So, what is it doing here in Luzon? Because we brought him here, he told me plainly. You brought him here, I said, nearly shouting it, eyes wide in shock. I felt more confused than ever. Why would you bring a terrible creature like that here? I felt rage boil inside of me at the thought of what they had done. You're soldiers too, aren't you? You're supposed to protect the country, not spread harm within its borders. I said, although at the time I wasn't really sure if they were soldiers like me. For all I knew, they could actually be members of a private army for some kind of organization that collects these creatures. Hey, easy now, it's not like we had a choice, he explained. The orders came from the AFP chief who ordered MPOC to deploy C-90109, since he thought the act would be an effective way of countering insurgent movements in the area. Well, he did a good job for the first few nights, but apparently his habit of mischief made him forget that our deal meant that he could only target members of the insurgency. He was out of line for targeting your man, and I apologize that our operations group did not realize the danger sooner. This was our first time deploying an act on maybe the last. I stared at him for a moment and took in what he said. However, out of all the things that he said... There was one thing that stuck out the most that I couldn't help but continue to think about. What's MPOG? And with that, he began telling me about the operations group and how they used mythical and paranormal creatures for various clandestine operations. He was a lieutenant that I had learned, and his platoon was one of the few elite units trained at deploying and capturing creatures and entities through the use of special methods and equipment. At first, I didn't want to believe him, but then again, how could I not believe him when one of the very creatures they used had attacked me and killed my squad? At the end of his explanation, I found myself with a new view of the world, as if my eyes were now open. I now realized that there were more things that lurk in the darkness of the jungle than just insurgents. This scared me a lot, and I realized that I suddenly felt thankful for the fact that an organization like MPOC existed to make sure that such creatures and entities did not wreak havoc upon these cities, towns, and burials of the country. Why tell me all this? I finally asked him. If your operations group is supposed to be a secret, why reveal so much information to an outsider like me? I looked at him and through the faint light of the moon, I saw a grin form on his face. Because I see potential in you. I've never seen someone with a strong enough will to resist the deathly seductions of an Agta. Because of that, I know MPOG would have a place for you. 
The recruitment season is coming up soon and the operations group only sends invitations to those who we think will qualify. Once the offer arrives, I hope you take it. And with that, he gave me a small nod before walking away. A few minutes later, the rest of the MPOG forces arrived to help secure the area and contain the Agta. Later that morning, I was returned to the army camp with me and my squad had left the night before. The official story was that my squad was ambushed by insurgents, and that I was able to hold out until reinforcements had arrived to recover me and the bodies of my rangers. For this, I was awarded the Gold Cross. However, knowing the true events, I felt unworthy to receive the award. This was my first encounter with mythical creatures in Empog, but it was definitely not the last. Two months after the encounter, I received a letter inviting me for the MPWOG qualifications. I accepted it and thus my career in the operations group began. You're probably wondering what this letter has to do with you. Well, the lieutenant I met during the Night of the Agta encounter was your father. He would eventually become my commanding officer and, in later years, a good friend. Now I know you're really curious about who he really was and what happened to him, so I'll tell you about his deeds and his ultimate faith. But I need to make sure first that you believe me. I don't want to waste time and energy writing a letter that you might just crumple up and throw away. So, if you get this and believe what I'm saying... Then I suggest that you write back to me and I'll tell you all about your father's time at MPOG. This letter was recently sent to me and I need help figuring out what to do next. For a few months now, I've been collecting various notes and journals of my father in order to create a biography in his honor. My father was a scout ranger who achieved the rank of major before passing away in an operation that was deemed so secret that until today... Me and my family still don't know what exactly happened. As part of the biography, I had asked various colleges of my father to write letters about their experience with him. I have received dozens of letters from his old army friends, but this one stuck out the most. At first I didn't know if I should believe him. Everything he said didn't make sense. My father was a scout ranger, not some special forces operator that worked with mythical creatures that don't exist. However, the letter came with a photo. In that photo were two uniformed men posing next to some kind of makeshift sandbag bunker. And both men had patches with the MPOG written on it. One of the men was my father. Do you guys think I should write him back?